So welcome to the Visiting Writers Reading Series. This is our last uh, guest this semester. Um, and thank you for coming to this event. Um, the Visiting Reading, uh, Reading Series exists because we have the support of the College of Arts and Sciences and of our English department. So we need to thank them. I first heard um, Micah Dean Hicks, our guest today, at the Calvino Prizes reading in Louisville. Uh, he had just won the award, the Calvino Prize, um, and after talking briefly with him, I thought, oh, I have to have him come to Clayton State and visit us. And he told me, well, you know, this is good because I have um, a book of short stories, and I can't remember, but I don't think it was published yet, but as soon as it was available, we invited him, and he came uh, to present his book of short stories. And um, so that's his second visit. Um, and during the first visit, it was, he also gave a craft talk, and our students who were here loved him. So some of them have already graduated, <laughs> but I'm still in touch, or they're in the master's program. And um, they, or, but unfortunately, many of them work too, so they were saying, well, you know, we love that he's coming back. So then, um, today, um, Micah is presenting his new novel. Um, which has received many applauses from the critics. I'll read you a couple of things. Publishers Weekly praises Hicks' wildly atmospheric and unsettling debut, a heady fusion of horror, southern gothic, and timely social commentary. Fans of the macabre will be enthralled. Uh, Adam Troy Castro writes in Sci-Fi magazine, this novel is extraordinary. Not just an early candidate for the best horror novel of the year, but one that can, we can present a good case for declaring a transcendent, committed and riveting novel for his, um, this historical moment. Micah Dean Hicks has produced a major achievement. So that's a lot of praises, right? So Micah Dean Hicks is the author of the novel Break the Bodies, Haunt the Bones, and you see it right here. And if you came here, uh, thanks to his generosity, we are, you know, we are, we have books that we will give you, free books. Um, he is also the author of Electricity and Other Dreams, a collection of dark fairy tales and bizarre fables. Bizarre in a good, in a good way. <laughs> His writing has appeared in the best American science fiction and fantasy, the New York Times, the Kenyan Review, Lightspeed, Nightmare, and elsewhere. Hicks grew up in rural southern Arkansas, and now lives in Orlando. He teaches creative writing at the University of Central Florida. So please join me to welcome um, Micah Dean Hicks. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? It's like good acoustics in this room. Thank you for coming out on like a cold, rainy day at the, you know, the end of the semester. I'm sure you guys all have like final papers and exams and miserable things to do at this point. Um, before, so I'm, the, the way I'm, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna talk about the book for maybe like 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'll read from it for 10 minutes, and then I'll take Q&A. Um, so it shouldn't take too much time. Can I really quickly, uh, show of hands, how many of you are from small rural places, like small towns? So maybe about half of you or something. I know we've got Atlanta close by, so some of you are from bigger places, potentially. Um, cool, okay, so I'm gonna talk yeah, I, I've got two talks, and one is about small rural places, and the other one's about something else. Um, so <laughs> we'll try that one. Um, so when I started writing this book, uh, which took six years to write, uh, I wanted to write something that was genre-crossing and wild and ambitious. I wanted to write something that was inspired by pop culture, TV, games, and visual art, as much as it was inspired by books. 
Um, so this novel has all these sci-fi, fantasy, and horror tropes in it. My main character is a telepathic girl who can hear everything that everyone around her is thinking about her. Like so, like all the like horrible, nasty, awful things that people think, she can hear it and she can't really shut it off. Um, my other main character is this boy who invents really dangerous machines, and he'll just wake up and find that he's created something really dangerous and strange and doesn't quite know what it does, like an engine that runs off of pain. Um, and he has to decide, should I tear this thing apart? Would it be better for the world if this didn't exist? Um, or or maybe, maybe I want to keep it. Maybe it's really cool. Maybe I'm proud of it. There's a sentient robot who's having this long, sad, unrequited love affair with the main character's mom, who's maybe my favorite character in the book. Um, there's an inhuman alien made of magnetism and light who doesn't quite understand what bodies are or that it can hurt people by getting too close to them. Um, there's a, another girl in the novel who can't lose at anything she does. She's this all-star athlete who um, every game she plays, every sport she plays, she always wins like relentlessly and brutally in a way that makes her peers kind of hate her. So there's a scene in the novel where at a basketball game, um, all of her team just sits down and starts studying and doing their homework on the court because it's not, war like they'll never touch the ball. They'll never get to like make a shot because she's just too good. Um, and then the opposing team sits down too and she gets so angry at them for not even trying. Um, she's kind of like a hero out of a Greek myth or something. Um, and then there's this whole town full of people who are living with curses and magical powers. There's uh, someone who's haunted by the ghost of his dead younger brother. There are monstrous pig people who've been Frankenstein together to take over jobs at the town's pork processing plant. They're self-slaughtering pigs. Um, and then the, the big trope that ties everything together in the novel is the ghost. Everything in the novel is haunted. Machines are haunted. People are haunted. The whole town is just sort of swallowed up by ghosts. Um, and it's the source of all the magic and pain in the town. And I want to talk about how that came to be such a defining part of the book. Originally, there was only one ghost in the entire novel. It was just one of many tropes. Um, which will seem strange to you when I read from it um, in a second because in the, this version of the novel, the ghosts are, are everywhere. Um, and I was writing about this small rural town in steep economic decline that was kind of rotting from the center out. There were no jobs apart from the one pork processing plant that didn't pay well and was really brutal to its workers, like mutilated them, carved up their bodies. Um, and, and everyone was in debt, like their houses, they owed more on their houses and their vehicles than they were worth. Um, and it was diminishing a little bit every year, the town, like always getting smaller. Um, and it was also a hard place to live because of all the magic and the horror and the strangeness. And writing this, I drew heavily on where I grew up, which is rural southwest Arkansas around like Hope and Texarkana. And those sort of small towns are really familiar to me, that sense of um, decline and poverty and strangeness. I remember growing up, uh, my relatives were always talking about like, plants that had shut down or factories that weren't hiring anymore. Um, and there was one particularly sad moment where I think a bakery went out of business and uh, everybody lost their jobs. And then a few weeks later it reopened under new management and it hired all the people back to work the same jobs they'd done before but for like half as much pay. Um, and you'd think people would be like outraged and would be protesting and would be really, really angry. Um, but they were just so grateful to have a job at all. Like they were really thankful because there, there were no other jobs, right? Um, which is interesting, um, and, I, and I think I've always been kind of bothered about that. I've, I've been thinking about that kind of landscape for a long time. Um, so I was surprised that early readers of this novel, um, editors, agents, um, you know, friends that I had read the book, like lots of people asked me, well, if this place is so awful, if everyone here is poor and broke, and if no one has any money and everybody's in debt and there are no jobs and this place is just terrible, why don't people just leave? Why doesn't everyone just pack up and go somewhere better? Um, and I really struggled to answer that because it seems so obvious to me, right? Like if you're going to go to a new place, you need a lot of things. You need a place to live when you get there to survive until you get a job. You might need a reliable car, which a lot of people don't have. Um, you need to be kind of lucky. You need to, you know, you need to have work there. You, um, and you might have a lot of things where you are that keep you there. You might have family members that need you. You might have friends that need you. Or like, you know, you have these ties um, that keep you in a place, um, even if there's not a lot of opportunity for you in a place. Um, and like, also, why would just moving to a different town? Why would anyone assume that going somewhere new would uh, do anything to alleviate their debts, their illnesses? and the way that they've always been exploited by you know, their employers for their entire lives. Um, and one thing that stands out to me, I knew someone in high school who did not apply for the ACT test. Do you guys take the ACT or the SAT? What did you guys take? Both, 
ACT. Okay. Um, so like I, I took the ACT uh, in you know high school too, going to college, and I, ha I knew someone who did not take the ACT because to him it sounded so transparently like a scam. I think like this idea that you would pay twenty five dollars to take a test. And based on your score, someone would give you money to go to college. He was like, well, no one has ever just given me money for something before. Like, no one is going to give me tens of thousands of dollars to go to school. And so from his perspective, it was so clearly a racket, right? Like, this was impossible. It was outside of his worldview. Um, and I think the entire reason he didn't go to college is because he didn't take that test. It didn't seem believable to him or possible to him, um, even though I feel like he was a lot smarter than I was and, you know, could have easily, you know, gone and, and, and done amazing things. Um, and, and not to say that he didn't, like, you know, have success um, with work and, and find good things later on, but I think that anecdote has always been interesting to me, too, that, like, what you, what the world has taught you is possible also affects the kinds of things that you reach for, right? Um, so, and, and growing up there, um, my family was, I think, considered solidly middle class. There were even people at school who felt like my family... Um, had money or that we were like quote unquote rich and this was because my mom had a job working at Red Lobster an hour away in another city and my dad worked as a maintenance guy in a lumber mill using training that he'd received in an army in the army if that gives you a sense of like how little work there was there and how like you know poor off most people were um, and a lot of my extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, and other people have supported themselves um, as long as I can remember through government assistance and through odd jobs and you know occasional acts of crime um, <laughs> you, you do what you have to do to get by, um, and there, there's just not a lot of opportunity in there. It, um, there's, there's something about rural southwest Arkansas that seems to me to be kind of a, a post-apocalyptic sort of place. Um, so I was frustrated by this question that people, like, why don't people just leave? Um, and, I, and I struggled to explain that through many drafts of the novel. I think I uh, wrote this and then threw it away and wrote it again from scratch and couldn't quite make people understand that. Um, and as a writer, it's really frustrating if someone doesn't get what you're trying to convey, but that's never, it's hard to blame, I guess, the reader for that. Like, you can't force people to understand something that they, that they can't understand. You have to find another way to help them understand it. Um, and since I was playing with all these magical tropes anyway, I ended up throwing the whole book away a second time and rewriting it, my third version of the book rewritten, or written from scratch. And I expanded the ghosts, and I made the ghost this force that would haunt everyone and everything in the town. Um... So now when someone's car doesn't start, maybe the engine is haunted. Um, and this might, um, and there might never be a way to get a ghost out of the engine of the car. And that seems kind of whimsical, but if your car dies on you and you don't have money to get it to a mechanic or have someone look at it and you don't know how to work on cars yourself, that feels almost like a supernatural event, right? Like your car was working yesterday, it is not working this morning, you have to get to work and you can't get to work and what do you do? It fe there's something about it that feels so deeply um, unfair and magical and strange that I thought that, that seemed kind of like an apt metaphor. Um, and uh, like people, your mistakes, your traumas, like all of these things end up haunting the living. They live inside their bodies. They speak to them in the way that anxiety and depression and, and you know, other things can, can speak to us. Um, some of these ghosts, as horrible as they are and as much pain as they cause, are the character's only friends, the only companion they have, maybe the only person who's sympathetic to them. Um, in the way that someone can be in an abusive relationship or a bad relationship with someone else, and they, even though this person causes them a lot of pain, they're maybe the only person they can rely on. Um, and this was the version of the book where my agents and editors and readers felt like, oh, I get it now, this totally makes sense. I understand why people would both um, be struggling in this place and be tied to this place and have a hard time here, but also why they would have a hard time you know, leaving. Um, and, and I think that's interesting. Typically, as a writer of magical stories, fables, um, fairy tales, things like that, I don't think of magic as metaphor very often. And usually for young writers, I advise them not to do that. I think the magical elements, the supernatural elements, should be in the book for their own sake. They shouldn't be just representative of something else. Um, but in this novel, it was a, a weird process where the magical elements ended up working very well to be representative of other things and also exist for their own sake. And, and you sort of get both, both of those things at the same time. Um, so I'm going to read now just very briefly from the novel, if I can remember which one is my copy, this one, um, for about 10 minutes or so to give you guys a sense of um, the ghosts and the, the you know, economic situation of the town and what, the, what these characters are dealing with. Um, and you'll get a sense that this is a very, very strange book soon. Um, Swine Hill was full of the dead. 
Their ghosts were thickest near the abandoned downtown, where so many of the town's hopes had died generation by generation. They lingered in the places that mattered to them, and people avoided those streets, locked those doors, stopped going in those rooms. But you might encounter a ghost unexpectedly. In the high school where Jane had graduated two years ago, curled into the hollow of a tree, hands out and pleading on the side of the road. They could hurt you. Worse, they could change you. The haunted downtown of Swine Hill had been slowly expanding for years, stretching its long fingers into empty neighborhoods where grass fissured the roads and roofs collapsed into rooms of broken furniture and shattered glass. For the people who'd lived and died on those streets, it was anguish to see the vine-choked houses, to know their descendants had run away from all they'd worked for. Their spirits, most present in the stillness of night, raged in the empty places. Even if she was late for work, Jane knew to drive around those neighborhoods. It was easy to feel alone. There were more dead than living in Swine Hill. Jane's aunts and uncles had gone out of state after the collapse of the tire factory and the lumber mill. The town jealously cleaved to the pork processing plant that had chewed up its sons for generations, hoping that in the end it would be enough. Most people Jane's age had already gone, scraping up enough money to start over somewhere else. The only ones left were those so poor they couldn't make it out, or so haunted they couldn't see a world outside their ghosts, or just clinging to a past they couldn't bear to leave behind. But Jane wasn't alone. Her ghost flashed bright and quick through her mind. Her car's engine coughed as she turned the key, something sputtering under the hood like a laugh, and finally grown to life. It accelerated slowly, heavy with the weight of spirits. The speedometer and gas gauge waved their orange arms erratically. Her windshield wipers often turned on without warning, and sometimes her horn would scream out of nowhere. She was happy the CD player still worked at all, though sometimes a ghost would settle into the discs, craving the bright sound of music, and then the stereo would play only noise. Jane flipped open a case of burned CDs and put in one after another until she found one that played, throwing the dead ones onto a pile in her back seat. Music crashed out of the tinny speakers, sticky electronic pop, the lyrics full of secrets, gossip, drama. The cold weight of her ghost swelled inside her, thrilling in the sound. Though Jane didn't know the ghost girl's name, it had been a part of her ever since she was a child. It was nosy, listening in on other people's thoughts and telling Jane what they were thinking and feeling. If the ghost didn't have anyone else to listen to, it would burrow deep into Jane's mind, unearthing her regrets and fears and making her fixate on them for hours. If it felt unappreciated, it might lie to her, withhold what it knew, or tell her the most vicious things people thought about her. But Jane had learned to manage it over the years, using music to placate it. The ghost had been her first friend, and now that she was still in Swine Hill after her classmates and family had gone away, Jane wondered if the ghost would be her last friend too. Something like fog rose as the sun slipped behind the trees. A chain of spirits so wispy and immaterial as to be little more than air, a mass of faces and trudging feet bleeding in and out of one another, drifted up the road to the Pig City meatpacking plant. These ghosts weren't dangerous. They had somewhere to go, a purpose still. The plant that had employed them all their lives was older than the town, the only reason that Swine Hill hadn't crumbled back into the earth. The ghosts were the unofficial night shift, still swirling through its rusted doors, crowding its blood-splattered hallways to do their phantom work. Jane plowed through them like snow, their distorted faces stretching over the windshield. She turned into the grocery store's cratered parking lot, the sodium lights casting deep shadows at the building's edges, the storefront murky yellow and cluttered with signs. Near the front of the store, the specter of a man slowly spun up from the asphalt and took on substance. He lay on the ground, holding his stomach and bleeding, a phantom box of strawberries broken open on the ground beside him. Decades ago, a police officer shot him while he was leaving the store. The cop had been called about another customer, someone yelling at the cashiers. It was a mix-up, a mistake, but one that had happened and would happen again. The ghost looked at every person who entered or left the store, his face a mask of pain and surprise, and mouthed, why? Jane, her shoulders tense, tried not to look at him and jogged through the doors. All right, skipping ahead now to uh, later on at the end of Jane's shift. A few minutes until closing time, the manager turned off half the lights, leaving the store dim. Jane leaned back against her counter, palms behind her, staring at the clock. The door sighed open again. With no warning from her ghost, a giant ducked its head and squeezed through the doors. He wore denim coveralls, oversized black boots, and a blue pig city cap. 
but he wasn't a person. His swollen arms, thicker than Jane's waist, strained the fabric of his sleeves. Thick gray hair shot from under his cuffs and up from his collar. His hands, resting on the small bar of a grocery cart, had four thick fingers, their nails flinty black. He glanced at her with an inhuman face. The creature had the head of a pig. Tusks protruded slightly from the sides of his mouth. His eyes were small and sunken, snout wet. Tall triangular ears stood up on either side of his head. His face was a puzzle of scars, like he'd been pieced together rather than born, the seams still showing. Jane squeezed the lip of her counter, waiting for the spirit to do what it would do. It was so solid, seemed so real, there would be no getting away from it. She hoped it hadn't come to haunt her. Her ghost rose in her, sensing her terror. What's wrong, Jane? It's only a man. The hulking pig man pushed his cart toward the meat department. It can't just be a man, Jane said softly. What does he want? Him, her ghost swirled thoughtfully. Nothing. He's thinking about work, thinking about pigs. He is a pig, Jane whispered, afraid the man would hear. Being as close as they were to the haunted downtown, Jane had seen plenty of strange things walk through the door. People so weighed down with ghosts that they could barely speak, bent double over their carts, flinching from sound or light. But a pig, a walking, grocery shopping, plant working pig, this was new. Jane walked down the aisle toward the meat section, letting her ghost get close enough to listen in on the pig man's thoughts. Is he angry? Is he here for a reason? He's just thinking about meat, her ghost said. Prices. Nothing at all. Jane could feel the spirit's irritation. There was nothing worse to her ghost than someone calm, in the moment, without a gnawing secret or worry. The pig might as well be a newborn, his flighty thoughts catching on the noise of his cart or the flicker of the lights above. The pig man's cart creaked closer, and Jane went back to her register. Her manager waited, a key in his hand. He dropped it onto her counter and backed away, thinking of the pig, but thinking too of Jane's ghost, of any ghost that might already be invisibly closing in. I need to go home, he said. You can lock up tonight. He fled the store, leaving Jane alone with whatever the pig man was. He thinks it's a ghost. He's afraid it came into the store just for him. Jane picked up her phone and pressed the intercom button, announcing that the store would close soon. She was pretty sure the pig man was the only one left. Here he comes, thinking about sausage, of all things. The pig man was easily twice the size of the biggest man Jane had ever seen. His shopping cart groaned with weight. In it, he'd stacked hams, tubes of hamburger meat, big cylinders of tenderloin, and plastic bins of pork chops. There was nothing in his cart but meat, most of it pork. He dumped it on the conveyor belt, and Jane started checking him out. The cheerful Pig City logo, a cartoon pig giving a thumbs up, passed again and again under her hands. Jane tried not to look at his snout or ears. He pressed against her counter, smelling strongly of metal and blood. She felt surrounded by him, his towering height, his shadow, his bellows breath. She rang up $600 worth of meat, then bagged groceries while he fumbled a wallet out of his pocket and carefully tweezed it open with brutish fingers. He handed her a Pig City Company charge card. The name on it read Walter Hogboss. She rang him up and handed the card back to him. Thank you, he said, his voice a snarl, a collection of grunts and wheezing squeals pinned with meat hooks and stretched into words. With that, the pig man pushed his cart to the door and went out into the night. Jane locked the doors after him, thankful that he was gone. He may not have been a ghost, but he wasn't a man either. He seemed like a man to me, her ghost said. She wondered if the pig man had come out of the haunted downtown somehow. There had been odd visitants before. Last year, right at dusk, a crowd of ghosts had flooded into the store and rushed the bakery, their semi-translucent bodies bleeding in and out of one another. They stayed there all night, the manager putting up caution, wet floor signs, so the living would know to keep their distance. As close as they were to downtown, lots of strange things slipped into the store, most of them small, invisible. Sometimes Jane went down the aisles touching everything, feeling for the special electricity of the dead. Any boxed dinners or pasta sauces or flour sacks that were possessed were thrown out with the expired goods. The stray dogs that ate from their dumpsters snapped at things no one could see. Jane locked up and walked across the parking lot, keeping an eye out for ghosts. 
She heard the creaking groan of a cart somewhere in the dark. She fumbled her keys out of her pocket, ready to unlock her car or defend herself. The pig man pushed his cart out from behind a pig city work truck, blocking her path. His basket-like hands rested on the thin rail of the cart handle. His gray fur looked white in the wash of the parking lot lights. He let go of the cart and took a step toward her. Jane felt her mind stop, her body freeze. Even her ghost retreated deep within, both wondering if they would be dragged into a black place, snuffed out between his big hands. Excuse me, the pig man said. Something is wrong with my truck. Her ghost leaned against her chest, listening. He's worried his meat will spoil. Jane took a breath. Okay, I can take a look at it for you. She walked toward the pig man's truck. He pushed his cart behind her, fretting about the meat. She didn't have to pop the hood to know what was wrong. The whole truck trembled with ghosts. They filled its engine, pinging about inside the cylinders. They floated through the gas lines and the tank. They curled in the tires and entwined their bodies with the electrical. She couldn't see them, but her ghost told her they were there, told her what they were feeling. A pig working at our plant. A pig wearing our uniform. A stranger taking what's ours. Send the pig back where it came from. Don't let it take what little we have left. Did you drive through downtown, she asked. The pig man pointed across the dark smear of the city center. I live on the other side. You have to go around, otherwise the ghosts mob you. You're lucky it's not worse than this. She was surprised the pig man hadn't ended up haunted himself. The ghosts must not have seen anything in him that reminded them of themselves. Can it be fixed, he asked. Let it sit here for the night. By morning, most of the ghosts should have moved on. Maybe your truck will start then. She doubted it, but there wasn't much else to do. The pig man thanked her and stood there with his cart. He sniffed the air. Her ghost read his thoughts, how he weighed pushing his cart straight through downtown against taking a longer way and risking the meat going bad. Jane sighed, already regretting what she was about to say. I can give you a ride home if you want. She hoped this wouldn't be a mistake, that the pig man hadn't been planning to get her alone in the close space of a car. That would be very kind of you, he said. All right, that's it. Thank you. Um, now, if you guys have any questions about anything, um, I'm happy to, to take those or comments or whatever you might, you might have. Yeah. yeah. What do you do to prepare yourself when you, you, when you sit with your environment? Um, how do you get into your mode? Oh, my like sort of to write, to, to start drafting. Um, yeah, I think when I was a younger writer, the, I had more rituals maybe, or I needed things to be just so. I needed to be very comfortable. Um, and I think the older I get and the less time I have, it's, it's just a matter of like, as soon as I wake up, trying to write immediately, like first thing before the world can sort of destroy me, um, because it only takes about three or four student emails <laughs> to kind of ruin me, and then I'm not gonna be able to get much work done after that. Um, and so working on this book, I think every day I would get up, I would eat quickly, and I would try to get in a solid like four hours of working on this before I did anything else. Um, and so if I taught later in the afternoon or something, I'd try to write before I had to go teach. Um, but a lot of it, I, I think, um, yeah, my, my process is, is not super specific anymore. Um, it's, uh, for me, the, the main thing, since I, I kind of have social anxiety and, and I'm a little bit of an introvert, I try to avoid having to interact with people a whole lot because it makes me tired before I get my writing done and then I go out into the world and deal with people and, and sort of get blown up. Um, but also there were, I think, big stretches of time in this, like, like now, for example, this time of the semester when I'm doing that heavy end of semester grading and I'm working with uh, students on their final projects, um, I don't tend to write a whole lot at the end of the semester, so more happens like kind of in the summers or, or something, uh, which is probably not a, a great answer to your question, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, Deborah. Can you, uh, when you sit down, do you just, some of the authors that you hear and read about, they can just go right through the book and then they have the book like that at the end. Are you like that or do you have to like draft out your chapters or do you have sometimes throw some of these chapters out or just say you have to do it? 
Yeah, the process for writing this book was really long and torturous, and I'm hoping is not the way that I will have to write everything, um, <laughs> God willing. Um, but typically I'm more, uh, like I see a lot of writers talk about the difference between pantsers and plotters. Are you like somebody who writes by the seat of your pants? You just sit down with a blank screen and start hitting buttons? Or do you have to plot it out and outline? I have always been kind of an outliner. Um, I enjoy sitting down with like a blank piece of paper and just like writing down ideas and like, like brainstorming story ideas. And a lot of what I do when I uh, outline and brainstorm is the same sort of stuff that all of you did in like the third grade where you do like free writing and cluster diagrams and things like that. Um, and so I do a lot of that stuff to come up with ideas and generate them um, and, and do like usually before I start writing a short story, um, I'll, or a novel chapter, I'll make a list of like key scenes. And so I already know like these are the main events that are going to happen and they're going to happen in this order. Um, and that keeps me from getting blocked. I don't tend to have writer's block or get stuck because I always sort of know, you know what's coming next and what I need to, to work on. Um, this novel was a chore to write because it started as a collection of link stories, which everybody told me was a really bad idea. Uh, and I didn't listen to them. I was like, no, it's going to be great. Like, the stories will stand alone. I can publish them in magazines by themselves. Um, and then, you know, I can add them together. It'll be almost like a novel. It'll be more than the sum of its parts. And what actually happened was that none of the sections stood alone. And when I added it together, I had this mess with, like, 12 point-of-view characters and no consistent, like, overarching plot or through line. Um, and it was just kind of junk. And that was the first version of it I had to throw away and reconceive of it as a novel and, like, outline it very carefully and then write it again from scratch. Um, and then when that one wasn't working, I tossed it again. And the final version of this that I rewrote from scratch, my outline, I in Excel, I had um, one axis, which was every chapter in the book. I knew it would have, I knew how many chapters it would have. And then my other axis was my four or five major plots. And so I tried to make sure that in every chapter of the book, I was moving those plots down the field a little bit. Like something would happen, even if it was just... Um, a character got a call from somebody or got a text from somebody or something that was still like touching on this other plot was reminding the reader that oh you know Jane has you know problems with her mother there's like something going on in that relationship um, there these plots were always intruding on the characters no matter what they were dealing with in those chapters and so I outlined this one really heavily and that was helpful for me um, I've heard a lot of um, writers like do it differently though they just sit down and start writing um, but I think for most of the authors who've had you know, novels published that I've listened to in the last few years, it seems like a lot of them are having to throw away their initial versions of it and redo it, whether they outlined it to begin with or not. Um, I think, was it R.O. Kwan that worked on hers for like 10 years or something and had to like toss it and redo it many, many times? And I think Lauren Groff famously like throws everything away two or three times or something before she gets it right. Yeah, but um, I'm definitely more of an outliner. I think that makes me unusual amongst fiction writers. I think most people don't do that. It's intriguing with the whole way you started talking about small towns mm -hmm. and having been raised in a small town where there's very much a culture that is self-contained within the town mm -hmm. and those outside the town never really understand it and once you leave the town you really are, it's like you, you don't exist anymore. They keep right. going within their own, uh, well now, in your story is the, the ghosts and their perceptions real or just real within that town and that's sort of the, the mythology or the legacy of the town as opposed to something that anybody else would also see from the outside. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, the, the ghosts are definitely literal in the story, like other people can see them or, or can interact with them. Um, but as far as whether they're a problem just in this town or the outside world, that's something that the main character doesn't know um, and is trying to figure out. Like her, this, Jane's struggle in, in the course of the book, she has um, her family relies on her, her brother relies on her, she's worried something bad will happen to him if she leaves. But she really does want to leave this place. Um, but she knows that most people who leave, they lose their attachment to their ghosts. And so she's kind of wondering, if I leave town, I will probably lose my ghost. And can I bear to lose my ghost? Because she's so close to me. She's like a friend to me. But also, if I leave town, will anything be better? Is every place just as bad as this? And there's one point in the book where there's not, the town is too small for a hospital. They have to drive like, I think, 30 or 40 minutes away to get to a hospital. And when they go, they find the waiting room of this hospital is just filled with ghosts. Like, there are all these, like, dead there patients and um, family who are still waiting in that waiting room and have been waiting there for, you know, decades or something. Um, and that's one of the, 
I think that's Jane's act of bravery by the end of the book is deciding like, will I leave or will I stay, not knowing if things are any better here. Um, but it's kind of implied that other towns are, are just as, as bad, yeah, that, that, that are just as haunted, that everywhere is kind of haunted. Yeah. So a little bit of ambiguity on that point, but that's a, that's a great question. Um, I like what you said too about small towns being their own sort of like sealed places. I know that a lot of people I went to high school with, um, uh, like their grandparents had owned farmland or cattle land, which they had given to their, you know, their their children. And then my classmates were, like, it was kind of their plan for their future was to inherit their parents' like farmland or something and to do that, um, which I guess is great for you if you have cattle land. But if you don't, what do you, what do? You, do? <laughs> you can't um, can't make a good living just like picking peas in somebody else's pasture or something. Um, you can maybe make $20, I guess. Um, yeah, go ahead. Why did you choose pigs specifically? Is uh, like the the species a metaphor for something, or is just one animal that you just chose? That's a good question. Um, I so yeah. How, why did I choose pigs? Um, a big part of it was that they already seemed so close to human, and I knew that if I was doing something that were like pig people, or that they would be human-like. Because Walter Hogboss eventually ends up like dating a woman in town, and people are kind of scandalized by that and feel sort of weird about it. Um, but I liked the the sort of similarity. I think like pig people, like pigs being like at least like, you know, somewhat similar to people, um, that worked pretty well. Um, and I knew the book was probably going to take place somewhere in the South or the Midwest. And um, I know that pig farming kind of happens all over the South and the Midwest. It's something that happens a lot of places, um, whereas other kinds of um, you know livestock you, like are more like sort of regionally locked. In Arkansas, it was chickens that most people raised. Like it seemed like a lot of people had chicken houses or raised chickens. And for some reason, the idea of anthropomorphic pig people are not uncomfortable to me, but the idea of chicken people are really uncomfortable to me. Um, and so I think I never could have written this had they been chicken people, um, which is uh, a little ridiculous, I guess. Um, There's another reason that they were pig people. I can't remember. But yeah, not, not especially metaphorical. I think those were the major reasons that had to do more with geography and, and where pigs are raised and things. And I wanted the story to feel like it could take place a lot of places and wouldn't be like somewhere that could only be in Arkansas. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm curious, so about half of you said you were not from rural places, so I'm guessing you're maybe from Atlanta or you're from bigger cities or something. And I'm curious to know if that sense of, um, act, like growing up, the, this sort of sense that I'm describing of economic decline from like my parents and my aunts and uncles, like the sense that there used to be more jobs or more opportunities and there were less now and things were paying less now and that it was harder now than it used to be. And the sense that things were like sliding um, into a worse place um, economically than they used to be. Is that something that feels true to you from being from bigger places also, or would you say the, it feels very different? Yeah. Well, I'm from Washington, D.C. So okay, so that's a bigger place. Yeah. Right, so every four years or eight years, depending upon what's going on in the White House, everything would change, and mm -hmm. so there was always a job. Oh, wow, yeah. Everybody always had a job. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The only time I, I saw where there was that kind of depression of the economy was when I moved to Boston, and it was in the early 90s, and things were very tight there. Mm -hmm. um, so as an outsider coming in, it was harder to get a job, uh, simply because the town's people, the people from the New England area would get the jobs first. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I had applied to different uh, doctoral programs and uh, was waitlisted on at UNH, University of New Hampshire, simply because I wasn't, I hadn't lived in New England for a long time, so if someone from New England who had applied didn't want the spot, then I might get it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that was a real, we take care of our own kind of thing. Yeah, I had a similar thing when I moved to Orlando recently, um, and, I, and I had my PhD, and I noticed there were a lot of jobs open at various like community colleges and small colleges in town. And what I didn't realize is there were people who'd been adjuncting at those schools for maybe 10 years, waiting for a job to come open, um, who were as qualified as me and who knew the faculty well or something. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm just very interested in this... Um, like this idea of like how I guess people feel about work and the, ec and the uh, economy, because I think if you look at like the job numbers or the employment numbers, um, 
they're generally pretty good, um, but it's deceptive, right? Because a lot of the jobs that exist are not jobs that are full-time with healthcare, with benefits, with retirement or something like the, we have a lot of jobs right now, but they're all kind of garbage jobs and you might have to work two or three of them or something in order to pay your rent. Um, and then where does that leave you, you know, when you, it comes time that you need to retire, when you get really sick or something. Um, and I think we're, we're in sort of a weird place right now. And I don't know how many of you are English majors, but looking, like there are a lot of industries like publishing, academia, and journalism all have kind of the same problem of this sort of um, contraction within the industries where there are fewer and fewer and fewer full-time jobs with benefits where things are really great. And there's, those jobs are sort of supported by an army of contract freelancers or adjuncts or other contract laborers. Um, which is which is all pretty bleak, I guess, <laughs> for um, to to be talking about this early in the morning on a Monday. Um, but it's um, it is an interesting problem that I think uh, all of you guys will, will you know be working on throughout your careers. Yeah. Any further questions? I get to think about the your pick people and the <laughs> economy. Uh, where I grew up, when I was growing up, it was all American flags everywhere, made in America, Ford mm -hmm. and GM. And now the largest employer in the town is a Honda factory. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of somebody who had been seen as the outsiders are now coming in and people are working for them for a lot less than they mm -hmm. have worked for previously. But they're just glad that anybody's there like uh, hiring them and having the jobs available. Right, yeah. Um, I know we have the same kind of thing. I worked in Mississippi for a little while, and I believe in Mississippi there's a really big, um, maybe Nissan plant? I'm not exactly sure. But when that was built, um, people were so thrilled about it because it you know, did add a, a lot of new jobs. Um, and it's interesting because I've talked to um, people who are you know a little bit older than me, and I think there's a kind of... Um, maybe sense that that people like one or two generations removed from me have of, of like like you you want to buy American um, and you you know you support unions um, and unions are absolutely really amazing but for, like um, for most of my life most of the places I, I worked there were there were no unions anywhere at all and especially in the rural south it's kind of hard like unions aren't a big deal because um, it's very hard to use unionize businesses that are spread so far apart um, and um, yeah, so I think all of that is interesting too. Work is in a, it seems like it's in a weird place in this country right now, and a lot of that has to do with technology, and a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, people willfully and gleefully rolling back protections for workers. Um, I guess is another aspect of it. But, yeah. uh, any other? Nothing else. Okay. Well, thank you again all so much for having me, and I will hang around if anybody did have other questions or wanted to, to ask about anything. I'll be up here for a little bit, but uh, I appreciate you so much. Thank you.